Hey guys, Montel here, and thanks so much for tuning in to this edition of Free Thinking with Montel. Our guest today is an 18-year-old climate activist, voting rights advocate, emerging technology developer. His work as a leader in the youth climate movement has been recognized on the international stage. He serves as the youngest member of the Biden White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. He's executive director and founder of the One Million of Us, which is a mobilizing is, which is mobilizing a new generation of young people to register and turn out the vote. He's the founder and co-editor-in-chief of The Climate Reporter, an international youth-led climate-focused news outlet. He has also spoken at the United Nations High Commission on Human Rights, met with world leaders, and has helped to pass the Clean Energy DC Act, which is one of the most aggressive and comprehensive decarbonization bills being implemented in the nation. He's been awarded the World Series of Entrepreneurship, and has been featured in Time Magazine, ABC, CBS, New NBC, Fox News, The Washington Post, The New York Times, and many, many more. He's also been awarded the Amnesty International Ambassador of Conscious Highest Human Rights Award, alongside Greta Thunberg and other youth climate leaders. Jerome Fox, for a second, thanks so much for being here and being a member of, of talking to us on Free Thinking with Montel. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. You know, I am. I have read through your bio, and uh, not only is it ridiculously impressive, but I was literally taken aback when I I read the the line that you literally became interested in climate issues at age five, while you were sitting around reading a book on astrophysics. Physics. I, I, first off, age five, reading a book on astrophysics blows my mind. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. So when, as I grew up, my family was all about just science and technology. And my first passion was like astrophysics and learning about like the galaxies and learning about like neutrons, like atoms and things. So my dad and my mom would like go out and get me books and like learn about those things. So that was that was my original passion. But I wanted to learn about my Earth as well, my own planet as well. But homie, wait a minute. You're five years old. Most five-year-olds don't read. How are you reading at age five? It, it was it was also a combination of like documentaries as well. Like I wouldn't also just be reading all day because that's not stimulating as much. But it was a combination of both. Like it would be a family event. My family would go out and they would say, "Hey, let's go out and, and read this book in nature." And let's come back home and watch the documentary about the same thing. So it was kind of like a full day of just being immersed in the topic, and it was just like a series of just things I was passionate about and just a awesome support network from, from my, my family, yeah. Well, your father's a, me a mechanical engineer, your mother's a nurse, is that right? Yes, yes. So that's what sparked you know, your interest in obviously learning. I mean, they were really, really very supportive of you learning early in life. And I, I was fortunate and blessed that I had parents that, that kind of uh, pushed me down that path early also, not at five years old, but pushed me down a path of learning early. And, but then that kind of, festered in you for what about two years and then you attended your first world environmental conference is that true um not exactly so after like i was really excited about um climate and, and about astrophysics i wanted to learn more so my parents were saying hey there's an earth day event happening on the national mall and we went and that was where i understood and learned more about what the climate crisis was all about because being five years old, you're more passionate about like the animals and like the species and learning about what they do and how they function. And it's not about like the climate crisis itself and, and what's happening to our planet. But there, when I when I was um, when I was at the Earth Day um, summit and celebration, it was learning about the nuances of this crisis and learning about the fact that there is like a ticking time bomb that that's that's going off and and saying that if we don't act in this time frame. We're going to continue to set off feedback loops that destabilize our climate, and I didn't know that at the age of, of at the young at the young age that I was. But over time, I, I studied and read more and became more aware of the climate crisis. And I said, if adults aren't going to do something, we have to, because for so long we've said that our children are going to be impacted by the climate crisis. But we're the children; we were born in this crisis, so this is our last chance to fix it. 
I mean, you, you say you learn more, but, but my friend, you definitely learn more about a lot of things. I mean, when you went to junior high school, you started down the path of entrepreneurship even at that young age, correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, so my activism journey is definitely not traditional. It's It was started out with coding and, and entrepreneurship through um, a company that I started. Um, coding in the seventh grade. <laughs> Um, yeah, was seventh, eighth, and ninth grade is my how I learned to code, and through that I started my first first virtuality company, Tal VR. Um, I started out in high school because I saw like the the inherent empathy that's built from that emerging technology of like being in a three hundred and sixty degree space and being able to step in someone else's shoes. So I was like, if we're able to talk about the climate crisis in a new way, virtuality is that platform. So I started with that, and slowly it merged into activism and organizing movements and organizing marches and gathering my peers alongside me to, to fight for this this um this cause. And I mean you you were you received several awards for that. You know, DC State Board of Education Leadership and Commitment Award back in 2018. You received award in 2019, you know, the Union of Concerned Scientists. But it, most of your I, I I guess I wouldn't say emphasis, but you literally were studying to see if you could make a difference in the world around you, right? Yeah, I would say that originally it, it wasn't it wasn't just me, but I think it's the energy of my generation. I think my entire generation has grown up and born around the, the aftermath of, 2000, um, of 9-11, growing up in the 2008 crisis and seeing the world around us having extreme roller coasters from having the first black president to having an economic downturn. It was like our generation always just wanted to figure out how can we change the world? How can we not just be swayed by the tides of, of adults and older generations, but actually forge change ourselves? And I think that is what motivates not just me, but all of my peers. Like this was, this couldn't have happened just by me um, striking in front of the White House for many weeks. It was because of so many hundreds of thousands of millions of young people that joined our movement around the world to, to have a call to action. Um, but yeah. And when you, you just said striking in front of the White House, but you started something which we call White House uh, Climate Strikes, right? Yeah. That, uh, was, that was while you were interning for former Congressman Lewis, right? Yes, that was, that was wow. It, that was the most impactful internship that I ever had because there, I as I say all the time, I learned tangibly that civil rights are human rights and human rights are environmental rights and about the intersectionality of these different movements. The civil rights movement talked about environmental justice. They talked about um, women's rights. They talked about how it's not just about um, racial harmony, but making sure we have a just society. And I think that is what really rang true through my internship and just being around the other staff that were in the office. And that was, that was why I started my voting rights organization about a month into my internship, talking not just about climate change, but immigration reform, gender equality, racial equality, gun violence, because my generation grew up in, in classrooms where it was funny to talk about whether you're going to shoot up the, 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 the dorm next to you or shoot up the, 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 the classroom next to you. And that continues to have anxiety as we grow older and say we don't want to grow up in, in, a, in, a, in a country where we can't even be safe in our own schools. That's what continues to motivate us is not just bravery or something that we thought was was good or thought we'd be able to, to be on the news or something. We're fighting for our, our safety and fighting for our lives and fighting for our future. That is what really motivates us. Tell me what it was like, though, for you to be around Congressman Lewis. I mean, it must have been a phenomenal experience to be able to be an intern in his office. Did you get much interaction with him? Of course you did. No, no, it's actually the opposite. Um, interns actually don't really, um, aren't really in touch with Rep um, Representative Lewis. I did meet him one time as he was um, coming in for, um, for a vote on the House floor. But other than that, it's mostly it was his staff that um, the energy came from. It was just sitting next to the other interns and and going through and signing co-sponsor letters and meeting other elected um, um, staff members. And it was it was it was just the, the energy of the group. And I think it, it wasn't that much interaction with Representative Lewis himself, but the staff was phenomenal as well. And it must have been if that his staff had to be uh, extremely motivated by him and, and spirited by him. Uh, I think almost in an infectious way. Absolutely. You started, what, a month after you were an intern, you started holding something called White House 
climate strikes. Okay. Explain what that is. Absolutely. So um, in, Jan in January of, no, not in February of 2019, I started climate striking in front of the White House as a part of Greta Thunberg's climate strikes. I started in Sweden uh, a couple months earlier. And before then, I had been working on like social media and working behind the scenes for, for the climate movement and doing more of the tech technology side, because that's where I came from was coding and development. But in February, I was like, in, in addition to, to coding, let's actually have our face shown in Washington, D.C. Because at the time, there weren't any climate strikers. There weren't that many people in Washington, D.C. that were doing climate strikes. I was the only one. So I was like, having our face in front of the White House every single week is going to have a powerful um, impact. So I stood out there and every Friday um, from 8.30 to 12, I, I climate strike in front of the, the White House. And it was it was definitely a, a very, um, I would say, dynamic experience because as someone would walk past, it would either be a tourist or a person um, who was coming past and already had a different political ideology and, and booing, or it would be a kid who was in his class uh, having a field trip and they'll wave and, and they would just understand what it was because it was always shocking just to see children come up to me and they knew what it was as well. But when you talk to adults, they would say, oh, what is this about? And it was just really a testament to the generational divide about the awareness of the climate crisis. Like for us, this was in every single book we read. For us, this was every single day we learned about this, this crisis. And there was no way to escape it because we knew that this is our lifetime. Because based off of the science and based off of the data, we have six to seven years before we start reaching irreversible tipping points where our climate continues to destabilize and continues to, to um, have communities at the front lines and not have access to clean air and clean water. So, yeah. It, some, it have said, that some have said that we have already really hit that tipping point, though it's really hard to convince my generation and generations uh, before you mm. of that fact. Let me ask you a question. I mean, you say that you've had adults walk up to you. What would they have the nerve to say to you when they walked up to you while you were striking in front of the White House? Some of them would say, go back to class. Others would say, what are you doing here? You're too young to be out here. Um, and it was it was just dismissive. It was as if I didn't have the, the right to be out there and advocating for my future. And sometimes it would actually be the opposite. Some people that had diff completely opposite political ideologies came up to me in their memorabilia and in, in, in the hats and the shirts. And at first they were like, tell me about this. Why should I believe what you're, what you're saying on this sign? You go on the mm -hmm. sign that said, pass the Climate Change Education Act. And I told him, I, I went over to the side for five to six minutes and just talked to him about the science and told him about the fact that we are in the midst of a six mass extinction where thousands of species are going extinct every single year because of our continual exploitation of our environment. And if we look at the science, we have the technology, we have the capability to actually transition to renewable energy, but we just don't have the political will and our elected officials don't have the moral clarity to stand up and say, this is the right thing to do. And once I just gave him feedback and gave him facts, he joined me. He actually stood there and, and stood in solidarity with me because he understood that this is not a political issue. This is a human rights issue. And this is just fighting for the basics that every human being needs. Well, when we look at the issue, and I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not arguing with you or disagreeing with you in any way, shape, or form, but when we do look at the issue and we take it apart, mm -hmm. we recognize that, you know, renewable energy and the energy issues around carbon, around airplanes, that accounts for about 30, 35% of the emissions issues that we have worldwide. But the biggest contributor is the consumption of, you know, animal husbandry. I mean, the fact that we literally cattle being grown around the world for meat consumption and Pigs, that's probably one of the bigger contributors, like it always has been. So how do we convince people that, you know, it's time or the, the generations before you, how do we convince them that it's time to start thinking positively about helping to make a trade, a change? I mean, contributing. I try to, you know, myself, you know, I try to cut back on the amount of meat that I've eaten. It was a period of time for a couple of years where I was literally a vegan or, or a, a vegetarian. And now that I do consume meat, I try my best to try to do and limit the number of days a week that I do that. But it's going to take everybody doing that to have some real true impact. 
Yeah, I would say that um, I really try to just talk about like um, the cultural the cultural history behind it because we know that Americans pollute historically around 360 times more than countries in Africa, around um, uh, tens of times more people that are in Asia and hundreds of times more people in South America. It's just about how do we limit it? I try to stay, stray away from people saying can cut it out completely because I know that that's something that they hold dear. Eating a, a hamburger or something like that, it, it may be something that's near and dear to their heart. But I think talking about the system-wide issues is something that's actually a lot more impactful. If we're able to speak, um, speak with companies and speak with the industries that are setting these trends and continuing to perpetuate the idea that we have to have incredibly harmful just meals that are carbon intensive every single day, then that's a huge problem. I think that um, from my perspective, I try to think of not just personal um, accountability, but also talk about the systemic accountability of, of companies and, and governments actually taking the, the responsibility for the fact that in the 1960s, 1950s, companies, you would have to return your, your, your bottles. You'd have to return your, your Coca-Cola bottle back to the company. There wouldn't be trash cans and then Coca-Cola saying recycle it and yelling at us for, for littering. It would be their responsibility. And I think we have to go back to a sort of system like that or have to come back to a system that's more accountable to the, to, to the organizations that are creating this in the first place. No, it, it's unrealistic to continue to, to say we have to make sure that we aren't eating um, certain types of meats. We have to make sure that we aren't um, con continuing to, to use um, lossy um, light bulbs or things like that. Those are small things, even if everyone does them. Even because in the end of the day, no one will do them in the long term. No one is that aware to do those things, even environmentalists. So it's actually looking at who has been accountable in the past and who has to be accountable now. Um, but yeah. Right. You found an organization that's called, uh, what is it called? The, a Million of Us? Yes, One Million of Us. And, and give me, what, what's your charter? What do you, what do you, what do you want to do with that organization? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one Million of Us is an organization that's all about raising a generation that is politically aware, educated, and able to, to be, um, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all about just educating our generation about being politically active. It's all about making sure that they know how to vote by mail. They know how to, to vote in person or any other way that they, that they um, choose to, to be able to be educated in it and able to actually act on it. I think that when we look back at the 2020 election, um, we were able to mobilize millions of young people through online organizing and through virtual reality and through events that we held. And it was all about the fact that only 20% of young people knew how to send a, anything in the mail, including myself. I had to teach myself how to mail and then get my organization, the people that were a part of it, to, to learn how to mail as, um, as well. I think it's just about the basic things that people don't think young people um, should be educated on that we go out and actually teach people about. Like in the 2020 election, we were able to, to bus young people from West Philadelphia to East Philadelphia to have access to the two voter um, registration areas. And we ho hosted a major virtuality event called Prom at the Polls, where we were able to capture the energy of our generation. The fact that we didn't have a, a, um, a prom in the 20, um, for the class of 2020 to say we're going to have a prom and we're going to go vote at the same time. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to do two things at the same time and really energize our generation to be even more excited to be politically active. So it, it's it's all about just empowering our generation to rise to the political stage. And how are you feeling about that? Do you think your generation is getting behind this in general? Or do you think that it's still like that, you know, 50% and 3% of people like you? But I mean, you know, your generation doesn't have a lot of you in it. I think that a lot of adults don't really see like how much action we're taking. About one in four young people around the world knew about a climate strike or joined a climate strike. And that's around the world, not just America. And even when we talk about like the Black Lives Matter movement, or we talk about the movements that have that have come in the past, young people have always been the faces of them. They've always led. Representative Lewis started when he was young. He started when he was in college. And so many leaders have started when they were in their uh, teens or early 20s. So looking at young people now and saying, well, are they going to step up and, 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 and continue to lead? Yeah, because we've always been leaders of change and we'll continue to do that because young people have a different mindset on, on, on our future. We don't grow up and aren't accustomed to the systems and, and aren't um, pessimistic about what can actually change. We're coming of age and saying, these are the systems that exist, but that doesn't seem to really 
to function properly. Let's actually figure out how to reform that. And we have the optimism and the energy to actually say this should be changed. Let's go out and organize to change it. And that's why we're always the leaders of change. And that's why we'll continue to be on social media, digitally or physically. You started a magazine or is it is an online portal called The Climate Reporter? What is that all about? Tell me about that. Yeah, um, The Climate Reporter, I started that um, in my 10th grade year. Um, it hasn't been as active recently, but back then that's how I transitioned from coding to more traditional activism was through writing, um, writing articles. I had started just by writing about why young people should be involved and why young people should be a part of the environmental movement. And this is around the time where there were only a few um, climate activists like Jimmy Margolin or Jutes Scott Martinez who were trailblazing. But it was like, I know there just can't be two people. I know there just can't be 10 people fighting for this. There has to be more people um, wanting to fight, but we just don't have the, the, the awareness of the um, information around it. So I wrote over 100 articles about the nuances of the climate crisis, what's actually going on, and also interviewing people at the front lines. Like going to the Lower Ninth Ward in Louisiana, where homes were, are still to this day not being rebuilt after the hurricane, or to, to um, Miami Dade, um, Miami Dade, where they have sunny day flooding, where s flooding is just a regular day occurrence, and they continue to just be just exposed to the climate crisis, but no one's talking about it on a on a wide scale. So through that, I was able to just talk to my peers and have a a, a generational discussion about what we're going to do about the state of our climate and. After that, I started organizing, and and the rest is history. Does it not frustrate you though when you talk about that? I mean, I'm coming to you from Miami, so I'm well aware of the sunny day floods, and mm -hmm. you know, and but well aware of the fact that you know the cat's out the bag. You know, the horse all yeah. blue ran out the gate. I mean, you, know, you can stand at the gate all day long. Oh, blue, come on back. Blue ain't coming back. You know, blue's down the road because. You know, tidal rise is here. We have, you know, ocean sea level rise is here. We took a look and we're looking at it right now. The fact that, you know, there are clear passages all the way through the Arctic now where there hasn't been a passage through there for a couple hundred years. Exactly. So, yeah. and and we're looking at the fact that I think the one thing that really threw me, I love reading articles about the climate myself also, but, you know, I've been, I've been really just, you know, focused on the fact that most people don't understand it within five or six years, the currents in the oceans are going to change. Mm -hmm. They're slowing down now. We may end up with stagnant oceans that we've already had, you know, loss of about 90 percent of the, you know, all the fish in the oceans are already gone. And we start stagnating that it's going to be even worse. But. I'm frustrated because I feel like, you know, how do we turn that around? Absolutely. And that's exactly what the work that I'm doing at the White House as a part of the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council is that well, now the Biden administration. Me, well, tell me, tell me how you were approached. I mean, that must have, you know, was there a knock on the door? Did you get a phone call? How were you approached to become a part of the White House Council? Yeah, they, they sent the email um, to me and they were, they were saying if I would be interested in, in joining this council. And I was like, absolutely. And I was like, it's about time that we're in the room. We've been fighting for years and now we're actually at the table. And to your point about what can we actually do, it's going to take intergovernmental unity. A lot of people talk about, well, personal changes. That's not going to fix this. The personal one light bulb didn't start this crisis and it's not going to solve it. It's about what the government's going to do. And what is the government going to do? They now have it where the Biden administration is allocating 40 percent of federal funds to environmental justice communities like Miami-Dade, Miami -Dade, where we can now invest and have the, the funds to invest in seawalls. And now that we have the funds to actually invest in climate resilient housing and make sure that public housing is also at, um, in, at the forefront of how we protect communities and make sure that education is also a part of that. Like, I think when we, when we, put, when we start with the price tag, everyone's like, well, how can we afford that? Well, how can we afford the loss of lives? I think are we actually going to talk about whether we're going to save a dollar or save a life? That's the biggest thing that is is changing now is that we aren't arguing anymore. The 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 controversy, the the denial is is largely over because people understand that this is happening and that we have to do something about it. America is the only country left that has a large population of people that don't believe that the earth is changing 
while we had fires in California, floods in, in, in Miami, we're having hurricanes consistently in the Southeast and in South, Southern America. And people are confusing what it actually is and saying, well, maybe it's just natural. This is not natural. People are dying. That is never natural for people to continue to be exposed to something that hasn't happened before. So I think the change is happening where we have to continue to add, ask for our elected officials to not only talk about the climate crisis and talk about whether we're going to um, put in place millions of good paying jobs, but actually call and say, we need to pass the Environmental Justice for All Act. We need to pass the Climate Change Education Act. That's something that people can do that makes a systemic wide change. A lot of people say, what are personal changes? In our personal lives, we interact with systems. So if we're able to change that system, that's how we have the biggest impact in our personal lives. If you go up and, and call Congress right now, you will have a major impact. If you go and share resources on social media about how to volunteer with an environmental organization, you are making a, a major impact. So but I think there, there's so many things everyone can be doing um, and not just talking about the, the small things. Let, let, let's think big. Let's think international. Let's think globally. I mean, thinking international and big, but also locally, you know, the environment has not been an issue that, and I'm so proud of you to be a person of color who is literally focused in on, you know, championing and taking the forefront on this. But I mean, can you talk a little bit about how climate change is disproportionately affects people of color? Absolutely. Um, I think when we talk about climate justice, people don't see it as a, as, a, as a social justice issue. They see it as a technology or science issue. But if you take a, a perspective on, on, the, on the realm of time, climate change is not only impacting our future, but it's already impacted us. Around 70% of coal-fired power plants are placed in black and brown communities in the United States. That is not coincidental. And when we look at whether um, who, who, which communities have been impacted most by the climate crisis, it has primarily been uh, communities of color and communities um, of low income. And when we think about that, we're saying, well, what is how does that have to do with technology? It has to do with socio politics. It has to do with where do we actually allocate funds? In the past, where we had um, from President um, Clinton or, or past presidents, a lot of the funding didn't go to people, um, communities of color. It went to communities that were already able to rebuild. And now decades later, we're seeing those communities still in ruins. So when we talk about climate justice, we have to look at the past and how we reconcile with it, but also look at the future and see how we innovate. And the combination of science and technology and also the social issue is what we're talking about. And when we add the layer in, uh, of, of race, it is incredibly clear to see that um, countries like Bangladesh, countries um, like um, Sumatra and Borneo, um, areas in, in, um, in the African continent like um, Uganda and Kenya that are seeing mudslides happening every single week, that is the people that have been impacted first and worst, even though they have polluted the least. So when we look at major countries like China and American India saying, are we actually going to make some changes? Are we actually going to um, look out for people, um, communities of color? They're saying, well, it isn't really affecting us. But if you look around the world and look at what's happening in the global south, you're seeing that they're being impacted right now. This is not a six to seven year issue for them. This is an issue of tomorrow, where will I be able to find clean water? Because now the Lake Chad that I used to be able to go to and get fresh water or where the, the fresh water pumps came from is now drying up because of, of rising temperatures and it's destabilizing climate. So it, it's also just an issue of not just race, but empathy. When we talk about the climate crisis, why has it just now become a global issue? Because it's impacting everyone. It's not just impacting black and brown people. As soon as it just doesn't impact us, now they're concerned. But it's been impacting us for a while, but now they're seeing it as well. So they're seeing that they can't insulate themselves from this crisis. So now they're investing with their, with their dollars. So in, environmental justice, environmental racism is key to solving this crisis because we have the wisdom and we have the knowledge to get them out of this. Drum, you, you seem to, you have the taste of politics in your gut now. And it appears to me that you are really the true voice for your generation. I mean, do you see yourself or envision yourself running for office anytime soon? I, I'm not thinking about that. Um, I am not a per political or partisan person. I am only there to to solve the issues. I'm not I'm not there to to give a speech about something and then have good words and good talk. I'm only there for the action. 
if they would just say, hey, we want you to be in this symbolic role to talk about climate change, I wouldn't have accepted it. I would have, I'm only there to actually talk about the key legislation and the key policies that need to be changed. I'm not a political person just there for the, the bully pulpit or something that's, that's beyond myself. I'm, I'm only an issue-based person. I, I, I try to remind people that I came from coding. I came from just programming. So that's not my, my thing of giving speeches and getting applause. It, it's actually doing something. Do you, are you having an opportunity now being part of the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council? I mean, yeah. what are some of the discussions that are going on there at the level that you get to interact in? Absolutely. Um, as a part of this council in the last two weeks, which is it feels like forever ago, but in the last two weeks, we've submitted our first draft report to President Biden on, on recommendations of reforming the, the executive order um, from 1994 that was inadequate to the moment of, of now and where we're seeing climate disaster across the country. We're also implementing a climate justice um, screening tool where we identify communities like Miami-Dade County, like Lower Ninth Ward, like Kern County, California, that don't have um, resources to be able to rebuild or be resilient from the climate crisis. We're building that tool to make sure that federal funding goes directly to these communities and doesn't get swayed or manipulated and it winds up not getting there. And the, the third working group is Justice 40, which I talked about earlier, which is 40 percent of federal funds um, going to directly to communities. And our role is to actually make sure that it's going to them, make sure that we know where that, that funds, how, many, how much funds goes to which community and making sure that their voice is actually being heard. Like this is the first time we're having indigenous people and people of color be the majority of, of the people at the table. And now we're the stakeholders giving direct feedback to President Biden and the administration. Well, let me ask you a question. What do you, what do you think about the fact that why would we, and I'm just going to throw this out at you and ask you, why would we right now <coughs> try to fund programs to rebuild in areas that we know are going to flood? Why don't we help people move out of those areas? I mean, you know, you look a, the planet, we look around the planet, we have probably 70% of the planet's population lives right on coastal land, all the way around the planet. Those are the most populated areas around the planet, coastal areas. And unfortunately, uh, over the next five to 10 years, we're going to see a sea level rise of at least four to five inches, which could equate to, you know, meters of lost soil, which means damaged property, which means we're paying and insurance companies are paying to rebuild something that's going to fall apart. Why don't we have more emphasis on reimagining like we want to reimagine the police? Why don't we have reimagining communities? You know, um, elevation is there for a reason. Keeps your feet from getting wet. So why don't we start to promote, you know, people from saying, look, you know, I get it. The coastline is beautiful. Everybody loves and wants to live by the ocean. But when I let you live there, your insurance dollars, insurance companies are going to have to pay to rebuild you when the inevitable is going to happen. I think that that's also a conversation that we're having as a part of the Justice 40 initiative. And that was part of the recommendations that we set forth was relocation. And um, but the other argument is that indigenous people, they have a connection to the land. That's sacred land. So we can't just abandon that and just disregard their their right to land as well, because we came and stole their land, polluted it, rose the sea levels, flooded their land and say, now you have to move. That doesn't sound right to me. So we also have to figure out ways to make sure that their sacred land is protected as well, not just abandoned. Um, and that's why we have both conversations of people that are willing to relocate. We're, we're investing in that as well. But communities that have a tie to the land and, and say that, no, we have to stand up for this. We're also advocating for that as well. So it's, it's twofold. Yeah, we're looking at both sides. And again, through your one million of us, is it a foundation or is it a? Yes, nonprofit. Nonprofit. So through your one million of us uh, nonprofit, are you you seeing this reverberate in your generation? Mm. Yeah, um, I think. Go ahead. Could you could you you're saying how did it, how does it? Well, I'm saying it's like you know, I, I, my friend. I wish that uh, every time I turned on my clicked on my computer, I saw a million of you, the uh, the million of us. I don't have a million speakers like you, a million advocates like you. Is it starting to grow to the million of us number that you want it to be? Absolutely. We, we've seen that. We, we, we've reached that number on social media um, through, through our organizing. But I think that 
the COVID-19 pandemic had impacted a lot of our organizing. We had planned to do a bus tour, TED Talk, um, a film. We had a, a documentary coming out where people could see it on social media, having um, a, many festivals and a summit. But as we come out of COVID-19 and continue to organize, we're we're seeing that our generation is not only excited about this, but it has been waiting for this. Like the climate strike movement, people are always like, how did it just grow from one person, Greta Thunberg in Sweden to tens of millions of people around the world? It was because our, my generation wasn't just learning about this. It's just that we finally had an opportunity to show it. We finally had an opportunity to show the scale of our concern. And I think that's what we're, we're waiting for now through 1 million of us, where young people just need to know how to get out and vote. And as we see continual mounting of legislation, making it harder to give water to people waiting in line, like legislation that's been enacted in Georgia, we have an even harder fight. We have an even um, higher hill to climb because we, we, every single day they're making it harder for young people and, and people that are at the front lines to be able to vote and able to be a part of the political process. So we're directly combating that and saying, no, young people are going to be here no matter what, even if you make it that we have to walk a thousand miles. We'll walk those miles because this is our future and we're going to fight for it. What's next for you, my friend? I mean, you're just getting warmed up. Yeah, this is just the beginning. This is not the middle. This is not the end. This is just starting. We are continuing to organize and ramp up. And over the next two years as a part of the um, Biden administration, we're going to continue to, to give recommendations on the next executive order. So now we have to um, be able to make sure that we not only talk about the climate crisis and talk about relocation and talk about rebuilding, talking about um, investment in solar and wind turbines, but actually train people. Let's actually look back and, and talk and look at the, the 90s where people were trained in technology and trained in those, those um, jobs. Let's actually do that for um, renewable energy. And let's talk about how we actually um, rebuild, um, not just rebuild, but actually make sure people are thriving and have economic access to not just have solar panels on their roof, but have carbon rebates so their wealth is building. So that year after year, their electricity bill is not only getting lower, but they're able to cash out tax, um, tax, um, tax rebates so they're able to continue to reinvest that in their families and communities. So it's just about a holistic approach and just how do we remake our country to, to be able to be sustainable and renewable. And I mean, I, I guess I, mean, I, I clearly see that a movement among people, at least, you know, the topic of the environment is something that brings all people together and doesn't alienate one group. But you know that you said a lot in that last uh, commentary about the fact that, you know, we have all over the nation a movement afoot to block the ability for people like yourself and people of color to vote to have a voice to be heard. Um, are you, I, I, I see that they walk, walk hand in hand and they work, you know, side by side, yeah. but at the same time, there's a little bit of a separation. There's those who want to advocate for climate change and those who want to advocate for fairness. Are you going to be looking at trying to figure out how we can get more people to understand that the vote is as integral to our survival as the environment is in our own survival. Yeah, I think that 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 intersectionality is is there. We've seen that like even the 2020 election when we yelled at people to go out and vote and had um, talks and had community meetings, we also talked about well, organizing plays a role in that as well. Um, I think that that plays to your question, but I think one of the things that that draws in between climate change and voting and racial injustice is that people just think about economics and 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 people that are that have lived in, in and had access to clean water and had access to economic um, mobility and things like that. People that have colonized are now looking and saying, well, people that are now rising up and now saying we we don't want to continue to be lynched and continue to be shot in the streets. We want justice. So now they're looking and saying we have to defend ourselves. We have to make sure that they don't have a voice. And the movement between climate justice and racial justice and gender equality is saying we're uniting now. This is not a se separate movement. We're coming together and saying our voice will be heard no matter what. And it's just a call to action that I think most people are just now waking up to it, but it's been here for about a year and a half. Young people have been organizing, Black people have been organizing in the South to, to say, hey, th this is our time. This is our time to, to not just advocate for justice, but advocate for coexistence. 
because that's the biggest issue is that they refuse to coexist. They can't just sit and say, let's live together. And that's what we're trying to build is, is that empathy and that unity. It, it's speaking to common ground and not speaking to vitriol and trying to just have clapbacks on social media, but having nuanced conversations about how do we get uh, a, a country in a world that is more united and is not continually stripped apart whenever any issue arises. What do you say to those uh, who, who really wanted to do something, but they just don't know where to begin? <laughs> First off, how do people get a hold of you or how do people uh, hear more information about your, your million of us movement or you know, your climate report? How do people, what's your website? How do they get a hold of you? Yeah. Um, my Twitter and Instagram is um, my name, Jerome, at Jerome Foster II, um, two eyes. Um, and there's so many ways you can get involved. You can go to one million of us or one million of us dot com and, and, and you can volunteer. We have so many chapters across the country and, and so many young people at high schools and colleges um, that are looking for more people to join. So if you're interested, um, we have um, platforms where you can learn about how to be um, civically active. And we were specifically about making sure people go from zero to 100, where they're able to know nothing about how their democracy works to knowing 100% about how to actually go out and vote, what things they need to sign, what what forms and things they need to do by what date. And that's what, that's what we do. That's that's what I love seeing is that people are being more empowered to be a part of the, have, um, have their voice heard and be a part of the political system. So if you're interested, there are so many things you can do, but the three easy things you can do is follow me and my organization on social media. You can um, join and volunteer. And one thing you can do is like right after this, not right now, but after this, this interview is call a member of Congress. You can go out and, and just call 202-224-3123 and call them and give them a piece of your mind about what bills you think should be passed and what policies um, should be enacted to positively impact our lives. There used to be a saying that, you know, a congressman or a senator, if they receive more than three phone calls, they would normally call somebody back. Is that still working these days or no? Um, yeah, I, I used to be the person who um, used to receive those calls and the person answering the phone. So I know that if you call, I have to put a mark on the list saying, hey, he called for this issue. And at the end of the week, they have to report that back to the um, congressman um, that, that's there. For me, it was Congressman Lewis. And on the next week, he would then say, well, 20 people called about um, climate justice. 20 people called about racial um, racial, racial injustice. So let's co-sponsor bills that reflect what constituents want. Because their mindset is that if you're energized enough to call, then you're energized enough to vote. So you are the most energized voters that are actually calling and making your voice heard, not just on the ballot, but on the phone as well. So they take you 10 times more seriously because you took time out of your own day to call them. Jerome Foster, I got to tell you, my friend, I think you are a lightning rod, my brother. I think, uh, you know, I look forward to seeing and following everything that you're going to be doing in the next couple of years. And I think it's it's uh, people like you that will literally, if there's a way for us to stem the tide, um, it's because of people like you that will make that happen. So thank you so much for what you're doing, my friend. Thank you. Have an awesome day. You too. Um, thank you so much for being a part of Free Thinking with Montel. And, you know, you know what to do. Why don't you make sure you tune in to the next Free Thinking with Montel. Thanks for joining me on Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Please make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell to be notified when new episodes post each week. We'd love to hear your feedback also, so please send us your comments.